What a joy it is to uh, to be here today and to consider uh, the gifts that God has given us. It's Memorial Day weekend, and uh, tomorrow morning on every federal, state, local, and many houses across our nation, our flag will be briskly brought to the very top and then slowly, ceremonially brought to half mass because of the over million men and women who have given their life in service to our country uh, an opportunity to say we value you we we recognize the sacrifice that you have made and and it's supposed to be a country where we honestly we consider uh, that this is a national day of mourning and we don't like <laughs> that's the problem. And so instead of mourning, if we're honest, most will simply uh, invite family and friends over and have a barbecue or go to a park and have a picnic with bounce houses and all kinds of things. And, and it's certainly not my intention here today to ruin your plans for a barbecue. But it is my desire to allow us to consider just the, the gravity of the situation that uh, we will be considering. We've seen some videos already talking about sacrifice, and and we've considered the reality that, you know what, We we would rather be at a party. And yet Solomon himself in Ecclesiastes chapter 7 verse 2 says, it's better to go to a house of mourning than to go to a house of feasting. It's better to go to a memorial service than it is to go to a party. (laughs) The first thing that you probably think is, well, you're off your rocker. (laughs) Because I'd much rather be at a party than a memorial service. And yet, the one who was granted all wisdom by God, as a young 20-something-year-old, Solomon was sleeping and God woke him in a dream and said, Solomon, ask whatever you wish. Then I'm going to grant that to you. And Solomon in this dream responded to God, I want to understand, understand wisdom. Solomon was a brand new king, just took over the fr- throne from his father David. As a young man leading God's people, he said, I need to understand how to live well. I need to understand how to rule well. I need to understand how to differentiate between right and wrong, good and evil. I need your perspective on life, God. And it was, of course, Solomon who went on to write the book of Proverbs, and he wrote the book of Ecclesiastes at the end of his life, considering all the lessons he had learned. And one of the lessons that comes up over and over and again in the book of Ecclesiastes is the reality that it's better to go to a house of mourning than to a house of feasting. And we might tend to ask the question, why? (laughs) Of all the places you can be, why would you want to be there? And the answer doesn't really take a whole lot of thought, but it does provoke a lot of thought. The answer is that at a house of celebration, at a party, you don't tend to think. But at a memorial service, In a time of mourning, you think about that which is most important. You think about that which is most valuable. Tomorrow is Memorial Day. The flags will be at half staff. The question is, will we consider the lessons that come? As they gave themselves for our freedom, will we consider the impact of their life? And would we consider, well, really the impact of our own life? Ecclesiastes 7 Verse 2 continues on. It's better to go to a house of mourning than to go to a house of feasting since that is the end of all mankind. And the living should take this to heart. See, that's why it's valuable to go to a house of mourning. Because one of the things we get to face is the fact that we will not live forever. This is not a message about uh, pessimism, but it is about realism. It's not a, 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 my goal to, to be a downer today in any way. In fact, it's my goal to bring us active. 
I mean, I did think about putting a hearse out in front and a casket behind me. (laughs) But I think just the gravity of our national weekend to consider the lessons that come in a house of mourning. You see, when you come to a house of mourning, you begin to think about that which is most important. And as you do, you say, you know what? I need to consider my own path in life. It says the living should take this to heart. What what should we take to heart? Well, that every man, the end of all mankind, is death. And that's why we hate memorial services. We do hate them because we're going and we're sad because we've lost someone we love. But that's only a, a, a part of why we hate those things. In some ways, even the bigger reason why we hate those things is we're reminded that someday somebody will be talking about me. And the question is, what are they going to say? You know, in Genesis chapter 3, Adam and Eve were walking with God. They were in the cool of the garden with God, enjoying the presence of God, and a choice was made. And with that choice came death. And with death came chaos of all sorts. And Romans chapter 5 says it this way, sin entered the world through one man, that man was Adam. We, I know we, man, we like to blame Eve, <laughs> but God places the blame squarely on Adam's shoulders. Sin entered the world through one man and death through sin, and in this way death spread to everyone, because ultimately we followed in his path. It's the reality that sin has entered into the world, and with it has come the inevitability of death, that someday somebody will be talking about me. And my question is, what will they be saying? You see, the reason that we hate these kinds of conversations is because we like to live in non-reality. Sort of like our reality shows, right? That are completely scripted to put people into positions so that they do things that, well, they may not otherwise do. We like to play in that realm. We like to play in the realm of non-reality because reality hurts. Reality is serious. We attempt in our desire to live out our lives to, to put death as far away from us as possible so that we can enjoy life. And yet then you have to ask the question, where does it leave us? Well, from the scripture's perspective, it leaves us inattentive. From the scripture's perspective, it leaves us dispassionate. In fact, death is a great thing to know that it is coming because it changes how you live. And that's why it's better to go to a house of mourning than to a house of feasting. Ecclesiastes throughout, Solomon says, much of life that we live is like chasing after the wind. You're chasing something you can never quite grasp. And in the midst of that whole thing, he says, let's consider then how we should live. And this is a warning that scripture gives throughout. In fact, James chapter four says it this way, come now who you say today or tomorrow, we will travel to this city or to that city, spend a year there and do business and make a profit. Uh, that, that makes total sense. I, I want to do this, and so that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to go here because that's what I want to do. And on the way, I will enjoy this and enjoy that, enjoy the other thing. And yet the warning comes, verse 14, you don't even know what tomorrow will bring, what your life will be for a while. You are there like smoke that appears for a while and then, and then vanishes. We tend to live life like we're in charge of it. We tend to live life like whatever we desire to do is all that really matters. And yet the scripture's warning is a constant reminder with words like smoke or shadow or mist or wind or like grass or flowers that fade for a little, are there and beautiful and then fade after. We recognize the fact that we need to uh, consider our lessons in a house of mourning. We need to consider our life and gain some perspective this weekend because it gives us the opportunity to to walk with God. Psalm 39 verse 4 says this, Lord, 
Reveal to me the end of my life and the number of my days. Let me know how short-lived I am. That is not something that we like to consider. (laughs) And yet, this is a prayer for perspective. It's a prayer to consider the important things in, in life. Psalm 90 verse 12 says, Teach us to number our days carefully so that we may develop wisdom in our hearts. See, if we don't consider the reality that the end could be any time, then we tend to live however we choose. Maybe you've even asked the question before, you know, if, if I knew that I only had blank number of months left to live, would I be doing what I'm doing? And the answer for all of us is probably no. And so it gives us the opportunity to ask, Lord, would you change my perspective? Would you allow me to understand that death is imminent? And in so doing, would you allow me to change the way I live? I think that's what God desires in a place of national mourning, is that we would consider. And in our passage, we have an appointment We have an appointment with a divine judge. That's just the reality in scripture. God says you are live, die once, and after that, the judgment. And Solomon reminds us in this passage in Ecclesiastes 7, verses 1 and 2, that there's really only two things that are going to matter in the end. And we don't tend to spend a whole lot of time considering those two things in the midst of just living life as we choose to live it. What are those two things? Well, the first, it matters. It matters how you live. It's not rocket science. Houses of wisdom, Solomon's wisdom, it's not rocket science, but boy, does it hit home. A good name is better than the, than the finest perfumes. Solomon says, you know what? This is, this is a thing that we need to consider. How is your name? What is your legacy all about? See, we understand the finer things in life. We understand fine wines and fine houses and fine cars. They are the things that our world gives value to. We say, this is a great thing, and I want to pursue that thing. Uh, maybe it's a yacht. Maybe it's a plane. I, I don't know what it is. First Kings chapter 3, Solomon has his dream where God is speaking to him and says, ask whatever you wish. And because he asked for wisdom in 1 Kings chapter 3, God says, because you asked for wisdom, I'm not only going to make you the wisest man who ever lived, but I'm going to make you the wealthiest man who would ever live. And in 1 Kings chapter 9 and 10, the wealth of Solomon is revealed. And just what is described, the, uh, the ranches and the, the gold and the vineyards and the castles and All of the things that you see in that passage are absolutely mind-blowing. In fact, if you were to type in on Google, who are the richest men in history? All of them would tell you Solomon is the wealthiest who has ever lived in all of history. It doesn't matter if you compare them to men of the past, like the Rockefellers, or men of the present, like Bill Gates, who we say, wow, billionaire, that is unbelievable, that is so much money. Solomon had more hands down than any of those men, probably combined. And yet, he recognized that, you know what, in the midst of this life, he had all of these things, and And yet it didn't get him anywhere. In Ecclesiastes chapter 6, it says this, Here's a tragedy I observed under the sun, and it weighs heavily on humanity. God gives a man riches, wealth, and honor so that he lacks nothing of all he desires for himself. But God does not allow him to enjoy them. Instead, a stranger will enjoy them. This is futile and a sickening tragedy. (laughs) Why is it that a stranger is going to enjoy them? Because he would have made the money and then he's going to, he's going to die. And then it's going to go to somebody who never earned it or deserved it. 
And they're going to say, wow, look at this. <laughs> and he sees that as, as so frustrating. And in the midst of this time of frustration, a little bit later in chapter 6, verse 12, it says, For who knows what is good in a man's life? In the few days of his futile life that he spends like a shadow. Here's that word again, a shadow. Such a short life. And the question is, who knows what is good for men? And here's the thing. If you seek the answer to this question within the box that we live in, then you will be as frustrated as Solomon. If you seek the answer from men's wisdom and the ways of men, who decides what is good? Oh, maybe this guru, or maybe that guru, or maybe Dr. Phil. (laughs) I don't know. But if you look for answers in the box, you're going to be frustrated. And that's why Solomon is going where he's going in our passage. Because he says, you can't find the answer in the box. You have to go out of the box and see the God who oversees all things within the box. He will make sense of, of what we experience day in and day out. Who knows what is good? God does. And that's exactly what we find in our, in our passage. God knows what makes sense. And what makes sense is a good name is better than the finest perfumes. We don't think much in terms of perfume today. I went to Costco about a year back and got my wife her perfume. I don't know, 50, 60 bucks. She likes eternity. For those of you who need to help me remind me that your wife likes eternity, you can go, go, get, go back to Costco. 50, 60 bucks is not a lot. We don't think in terms of perfume today. But in the ancient world, perfume was the sign of, of ultimate wealth. In fact, even in the Christ story, as Christ was born and then a couple years later, as we know the story really unfolds, a magi came from the east looking for the king to present him gifts, gifts that represent the wealth of the kingdoms. And one of those gifts, of course, was myrrh, a very fine perfume. This is the best our kingdom has to offer, perfume. You have in John chapter 12 where Mary bows in a time of intimate worship and takes a vial of nard, a very fine perfume, and breaks it over Jesus' feet and then puts her hair in it and rubs his feet with her hair. Perfume. What's the big deal? Well, Judas looks on. He had already given himself over to the lusts of this world, the desires of the flesh. And he says, what are you doing? That perfume is worth, that little tiny vial of perfume is worth a whole year's wages. And you just wasted it on the feet of Jesus. See, Judas had searched for the world and lost his soul in the process. And in the midst of that, He earned himself a name that is anything but good. The word good in our passage here, it's a word of comparison. A good name is better than the finest perfume. The thing that the world seeks after, the world that the the world loves, it's nothing compared to a good name. And throughout scripture, this word good is used as an object being what it was intended to be by God. God designed it, God put it together, and he says, this is good. He did that with creation. He said, this is exactly the way I want it. And it is, after each day, it is is good. It's exactly the way I wanted it. Why was it exactly the way he wanted it? Because it came from, from him. After the Israelites were struggling in the desert. They decided as Moses was going to go up on the mountain in Exodus chapter 20 to get the good, the good commandments, right? The wonderful commandments, the 10 commandments of God. The people were waiting. They saw the signs of God on the mountain, but they were waiting at the bottom of the hill. In the midst of waiting, they said, you know what? This is taking too long. We, we got to figure this thing out for ourselves. Moses is gone. We need to worship. And so they built a, a golden calf. Don't miss the idea that it was golden, right? It was something of value. We've got to do this. And Moses comes down as they were worshiping. And in the midst of their worshiping, Moses says, what are you doing? 
And God decided at that moment that, you know what? I'm a God of my word. I'm going to let you go to the promised land, but I'm not going with you. And in the midst of that discussion that God and Moses were having, Moses says, God, please, please don't send the people without you, for it is your name, God, that makes us who we are. It is your name that goes with us. Please don't. And God said, all right, I will go with you. And Moses, sort of not satisfied with that answer, says, God, please give me a sign. And God says, I'm going to set you into the cleft of a rock. And I will let my goodness pass before you. Same exact word, my goodness pass before you. And in Exodus chapter 34, verses 6 and 7, it says, God's goodness passed before him. And the goodness announced the name of God, the Lord, the Lord, the compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger and abounding in loving kindness, faithful to thousands, forgiving wickedness, rebellion, and sin. When we think of goodness, we need to think of God's name because it is God's name that really gives us clarity on what goodness truly is. And goodness for us is our name characterized by a life that is flowing morally and ethically from a God-centered existence. That we know who God is, we know the character of God, and we are seeking to take the character of God onto ourselves. That is a good name. That is something that will be rewarded better than anything you can pursue in this life. Riches untold is a good name. And my question for you today is, are you building a good name? Are you creating a good legacy? Are you considering the path that you have, have chosen? You now, as I, I come today, I don't come as one who's, who's arrived. In fact, these questions that I'm about to ask you come very much from me asking myself continually these questions. I am in memorial services probably five to six times a month. Just caring for people, loving on people. I am constantly being reminded of the fact that someday somebody's going to talk about me. And these are the questions that I begin to ask myself. Am I building a, a legacy of faith? Or maybe asked another way, how is my, my love for God? Am I honoring God's word in my life? Am I abiding in Christ where there's a growing intimacy where I'm seeking the Lord and hungering for him? Am I seeking intimacy and fellowship that when the church gathers, am I there in its midst, sharing my hurts and sorrows and my joys and, and the great things that God has to offer? How is my love for God? How is that reflected in my life? Am I walking with God? Am I valuing time with God's people? Am I considering the ways, serving with my gifts? Am I extending God's kingdom? This is a question that says, you know what? Am I earning a good name for myself? And I ask this question all the time because, you know, here's what I consider. I consider myself in, in, in one of three chairs, and you're in one of these chairs as well. Right now, I'm in the chair as the spiritual leader of my home. And that's a, that's a beautiful chair. I love this chair. And I am passionate about the Lord, and I am hungry for the Lord. But guess what? The chair right behind me is my children. And guess what they're watching? They're watching me. And guess who's going to be watching them? Well, that's the third chair. That's my grandchildren. And here's the thing. I can... Walk with God in all fervency. Or I can play the game and not really walk very well. And then my children come along and because they've kind of grown up in the church, maybe they'll get a little bit of what I've given them. If it's a passionate pursuit of God, then guess what? They have a better chance of becoming passionate for God. If I am flat, uninterested, I show up, and, and we hang out together and then we leave, guess what my kids are going to be? Less than I am. And guess what my grandkids are going to be? Less than they are. And that's my desire. I don't know what seat you sit in. Maybe you're here today and you're passionate, you're hungering for God, or maybe you're in the second seat, you're just kind of muddling along. And you say, you know what, what is my purpose here? 
Am I loving God with everything I am? Because we don't have the option to decide for the next generation how they will respond to God, but we do have the option to decide how I'm going to respond to God. And if they're going to talk about me someday, I want them to say, he was a man who was hungering for God's word. He was passionate for the purposes of God. He served with his gifts. He didn't just muddle along. Where are you today in the midst of that? A building a legacy of faith. How about building a legacy of family? How is my love for spouse and, and children? As a spouse, are you fulfilling God's ordained role for you? Are you walking in faithful and exclusive love? I can't tell you how many services I've gone to where there's the first wife and the second wife and sometimes the third wife. And the honor guard has to decide who gets the flag. How do you do that? The recognition that my love for my wife must be faithful and it must be fervent. It's it's not one of those things that that I kind of just let wane, but it's a love that lasts. Am I seeking intimacy with her and enjoying her? Is she seeking intimacy with me? Are you as a wife seeking your husband and a husband seeking your wife? Are you pursuing things that even, even when the flowers wilt and the chocolate melts in life, that you know that being together is better than anything else. I can tell you what your children's marriage will be like by looking at your marriage. What's the legacy that you're leaving? Are you servant-hearted and attentive and united in your pursuits with one another? That's a legacy. That's a good name. With your children, are you present with them, involved in their lives, connected, patient, mentoring them, a person of of integrity? If there's one thing children react to, it's saying one thing and doing another. And their faith relies on you. I asked Madison the other day, what are some things that you would say, I do, that you love? And the first thing that came to her mind, food. You feed us. (laughs) Now, Madison is nine, so she didn't put a whole lot of thought into that one. But if I continued to probe her, you know what she would say? She would say, Daddy, would you snuggle with me? And then she would say, no, Daddy, not with your phone. And yet that's become our life. We're so attached to things outside that we have no attachment to the things that are inside. What about a legacy of friendship? A legacy of friendship starting from outside your home where you're blessing and caring for others who are nearby and then extending that out to the uttermost parts of the earth. A legacy of compassion and mercy and and, and a willingness to step in. One of the things I love about doing services is when somebody has loved his wife well, His children acknowledge it. And then their friends say he was the best. What a joy that is. I don't know where you are today. We missed so much time in building a portfolio and a resume. But this is the only thing that matters. is a good name. And it's my desire today to say, you know what? What's your perspective on life? How are you you doing? Lord, Would you change my perspective? Because ultimately a good name is to be chosen over great wealth. And favor is better than silver and and gold. So much time spent, so much time, if we were honest, wasted. What are we living for? What does our name consist of? Does it reflect the character and love of God? Let's consider, Lord, would you change my perspective? It's good to be in a house of mourning. Why? Because... I consider my own legacy. And in the midst of it, I, I say, you know what? We've got it behind appointments. There's a judge waiting and he's going to reward. And Solomon says, there's only two things that matter. It matters how you live and it matters, it matters where you're headed. <laughs> it matters where you're headed. See, here's the thing. Wisdom of Solomon written all over it. The day of one's death is better than the day of of one's birth. It's better to die than to be born. And you sit there going, oh, 
Wait a second. I mean, we love birth. I mean, we have baby showers and plan for them and we so rejoice in them. And if you're on Facebook, they'll take pictures of the, of the little black picture that nobody can make anything out of, right? But the doctor himself who has to point out all of the parts, but you're so excited because you have a picture, right? It's so exciting. We love that. If you're on Facebook, I can't tell you how many people are counting down the day. They set their due date and it's counting down. It says three weeks, two weeks, one week. And it's like, wow, that is so exciting. And you know what? God loves birth too. Psalm 139, 13 through 16 says, God knit us together in our mother's womb. It says, I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. When I was made in that secret place, the the womb, when I was woven together in the depths of the earth, an image, a poetic image of the womb, your eyes saw my unformed body. All the days ordained for me were written in your book before even one of them came to be. God loves birth. But Solomon touches on something here that we don't like to, to think about. You see, with birth comes a mixed bag. That's what I like to call it. Life is a mixed bag. You reach into that bag, you're not sure what you're going to get back out of it at various points and times. We love the fact that we're born into a family and and we have brothers and sisters and a mom and dad and and we can celebrate uh, fun times on vacations and things like that. That's the beautiful thing of life. You have friends and you have worship and you have uh, joy and you have happiness and you have laughter, all of these good things. We love those things. But along with life comes pain and tears and brokenness and shame and sadness. When Adam and Eve sinned, they plunged this earth and all who follow in their footsteps into a measure of chaos. It's not that God is absent, so there is still joy. It's not that God is absent, so there is still his favor that we experience. But the reality is, With desperation and chaos comes difficulty. And it's a mixed bag that we live in today. And here's the thing, what's the good news? That's the question, right? I mean, the day of one's death is better than the day of one's birth. What's the good news? Well, the good news is only for those who are believers in Christ. Because this is not true if you're not a believer in Christ. You see, if you're not a believer in Christ, this life is the best it's going to get. Mixed bag and all. The difficulties, the pain, a little bit of joy sprinkled in here, the the, the making of money and the losing of money, that's all there is outside of Christ. And so if you haven't come to a saving relationship with Jesus Christ, this is so important for you to hear, to recognize that, you know what? There is nothing else that matters. I did a memorial service last evening, 5 p.m. And I was told by the family, we we don't really want a whole lot of that spiritual stuff. And they had so much good things to say about their loved one who passed away at 56 years old. Surprise. And yet, that's all there was. And nothing more. And that's the reality when you come to a relationship with Jesus Christ. It opens up new worlds. And if you don't, it leaves you in this one, which is is dreadful. That's why people who are Christless are hopeless. If they have a memorial service, and certainly you've been to one like this, where they they say, oh, they're in a, a better place. And what does that mean? So we have no idea where they are. I don't really know what it's going to be like. I don't even know really if there's anything there at all. There's sort of this vain attempt at some measure of comfort. And yet the reality is there isn't comfort. It's a blurry vision of the next life that's filled with emptiness. And so the day of one's death is better than the day of one's birth. Why? Because when you die and Christ, God takes this mixed bag and he removes it. Praise God for that. This past Wednesday, I was able to care for Pam Lawrence and her family. Some of you may have known that her mom, Marianne, passed away this last week, a week and a half ago now. 
And so on Wednesday, I went down to be with the family, and, and Pam shared a bit at the service with her mom's casket right behind her. It was such a beautiful time because Pam was so encouraged. She was so excited. Why? Because she knew for her mom this wasn't the end, it was the beginning. She knew where her mom was. And she knew where her mom was because at 80 years old, Pam was sitting in their kitchen having a conversation and her mom revealed, you know, I'm 80 years old. And I don't know what I'm doing. I don't know where I'm going. I don't know what's next. And Pam, through a brief conversation, was able to introduce a mom who had grown up in Catholicism and knew when to sit and when to stand and when to rise up on cue, but didn't know the Savior who could give her hope for a future. And Pam introduced her to that Savior And she came to Saving Faith at 80 years old. Lessons in a house of mourning, it's never too late. Unless you're already gone. And at 80 years old, she came to Saving Faith. And within about, and I'm not exactly sure of the exact time, but within about five years, her mom's mind went dark with Alzheimer's. Pam had about four or five years to walk with her mom in faith. Her mom passed away at 96 years old, 11 years in the darkness, just waiting for her body to allow her to get to heaven. But it was in those couple of years that Pam saw her mom rejoice and grow and read her scriptures. And as I was at that service, Pam shared something, and I want to share it with you. These are her exact words. And this is the encouragement that we can have in death. She said this, If my mother taught me anything in her life, it was at 80 years old, she still had the courage to admit that she was unsettled about her life. She didn't know that the God she had gone to worship all of these years didn't know who he was. She didn't have peace. At 80, she sat down with a cup of coffee And introduced herself to Jesus and asked him to be her savior. And she says, we ache at funerals. We hate to stand at a casket and say goodbye. Because something in us says this isn't right. Something in us knows we were built forever. Mom asked for and received peace and assurance about this day. Years ago. She needed to know she was amazingly loved and forgiven by the God who created her. And that's why I can stand here today and rejoice at her home going because now she is truly in home. And I look forward to seeing her again, perfect in glory. And then Pam read this quote from Charles Spurgeon. Unbelief bemoans the evening shadows, the darkening night, the end of existence. But no, no, cries faith. The night is over and the true day is at hand. The pearly gates are open and the golden streets shine in the jasper light. That's where mom is. And I am so grateful. That's her words at a time where she was mourning the loss of her mom. Why was she so comforted? Because she knew where her mom was going. She knew what was ahead. In fact, Pam, in many ways, wishes she could have beat her there. Because that's the heart cry of those who believe, Lord, I'll stay for a while if that's what you need. But to be present with the Lord is so much better than to be be here on earth. Why is that true? Well, let's just briefly look at Revelation chapter 21, verse 1. It says this, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea no longer existed. <laughs> Rejoice that the old is gone and the, the new has come. You see, the old was filled with curses. Sin had plagued this land. Even the sea is no longer needed. Why the sea? We love the sea. The beach. Oh, no beach. The sea is a place, the scriptures say, that swallows up the dead. In Revelation chapter 13, it describes the dragon coming out of the sea to persecute the people of God. God says, no sea, no curse, it's all gone. This is not a refurbishing of something old, it's something brand 
new, perfect, exactly the way he designed it. It goes on and tells us a little bit about this city. It says, I also saw a city, the holy city, new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared like a bride adorned for her husband. What a, what a glorious picture that is. I can't, honestly, I cannot think of a better picture of a bride at, for her husband to look at expectation and desire and joy. I can still see the day when I got married to Nikki 22 years ago and as the doors of the back of the church opened and the light flooded in and she crossed through that light to come down that aisle. What an amazing image that is. And that's exactly what we have. This is a holy city. It's God's city. Why is it God's city? Look at our passage. It says, look, look, behold, God's dwelling is now with humanity. And he will live with them and he will be his people and God himself will be with them and be their God. There's no longer a sense of separation. There's no longer a sense of God is distant and I am here present. There's no longer a sense that God escapes from the distant, comes into the present, for example, in Jesus Christ, where we're close and intimate with him, and then he dies and then goes back to heaven. So there's distance again. It's not distance and closeness and distance. It's now, distance is now turned into closeness and intimacy What better thing could we desire? Our passage goes on and says, guess what? The mixed bag, well, he's going to remove it. Look at this. Verse 4, he will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Death will no longer exist. Grief, crying, and pain will exist no longer because the previous things have passed away. What is our guarantee in heaven? The things that we love about this life, those things continue. We love worship, and guess what? Worship continues. We love joy, and we love laughter, and those things continue. And we love family, and there's reunion in heaven. But the things that we hate about this life, brokenness, God heals. Tears, God wipes away. Death, the sting of death is, is gone. It's been replaced with eternity. How, how can we be certain that this is true? How can we be certain that this is really going to happen? Look at our passage. It says, Then the one seated on the throne said, Look, I am making everything new. He also said, Right, because these things are faithful and true. And he said to me, It is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give water as a gift to the thirsty from the spring of life. God says, You know what? Who's going to make this true? I'm going to make this true. I'm from the beginning and from the end. I'm outside the box. And I can do this. And I have spoken. My name is my word. And what is my name? My name is Alpha and Omega. I am the one who is faithful. I am the one who has said, look, all things are new. These words are faithful and they're true. They can be relied upon. There is no fear of death for those who belong to Christ. Amen? Amen. Absolutely. This is the good news that he's going to give the gift and he's going to base it on himself as a gift giver. Who gets the gift? Well, here's our passage. The victor will inherit these things and I will be his God and he will be my son. He will be, we will be sons and daughters of God. Who's the victor? The victor is the one who came to saving relationship with Jesus Christ. The victor is the one who has walked under the lordship of Christ, building a legacy of faith as he loves his family and as he cares for the world around him for the glory of God because he wants his character to reflect the goodness of God. That's the victor. The victor is the one who isn't stumbling over trials and losing his faith or walking into temptation without sense of what's coming next. God's reminder to us is this, that he has made all things new. How can we be sure? Because he's put his name on it. In fact, the very one who said it is finished and paid the penalty for our sins says now it is done. It is over. And so my question for you is what is your perspective? What's your perspective on life? How are you living it? Unfortunately, in the age of mass media and mass communication, we have the reality that life gets muddled with reality TV. It gets skewed. I recently read an article, and I just thought this was was so important. 
I read an article recently on Fox News discussing ABC's reality show, The Bachelorette. It's a bachelorette. You, you know the story where a bachelorette comes and tries to win the hearts of 12 or 13 guys. And in the midst of that show, after it was finished taping, but before it aired, one of the bachelors died in an accident. He was one of those extreme sports guys, and, and he died in the midst of it. And then the season aired, and he was still in the show. ABC didn't cut him out. They made the decision to leave him in. And everybody got upset and angry that they would do such a thing. Dr. Keith Ablo, a psychiatrist who works as a medical expert with Fox News, said this. The usual contrivances of the bachelorette are all in place, of course. A pretty woman agrees bizarrely to choose a fiancé from a collection of men who also strangely compete for her on national television. These people are regarded as sane only because our culture has gone utterly insane, he says. This season, though, ABC tripped over a bit of reality for its fake reality series. Eric Hill died. He was young, he was adventuresome, and his untimely, very unscripted death was shocking and could actually teach viewers something about life. And here he says, the truth is, that life is fleeting, that death is unpredictable, and that each of us should spend life pursuing things that matter while attempting to do others no harm. And it is Mr. Hill's very unfortunate legacy that he will be remembered by millions of people who did not know him as someone whose last widely known project in life was playing himself on TV, trying to seduce a woman who was not worthy of seducing. That was his legacy. And ABC let it be shown. Why didn't people like it? Because they don't want to look at death. They want to pretend and and fake life. My desire for you today, as you wander through this weekend, and day by day as you wander through life, is that you would consider your name. That you would consider your future. And that you would live in light of that. For that is the best the best way to live. Bow your heads with me. Father, we, we celebrate your goodness to us. Father, thank you so much that for those who have come to saving faith in Jesus Christ, that we have a future that is so good, it's not to be compared with anything else. We can't even fathom the, the wonders of heaven and the joy that we will experience. And yet, Father, there are some who are here who very likely may just be playing a game. They've created their own reality show right here sitting in our seats. Lord, I pray that you would remind them that while we might be able to fake it in life, death is a great equalizer and you see all things. I pray, Father, that if there are any here today that need to seek you as Savior, they need to begin to walk with you, to confess their sin, and to acknowledge that you are God and they are not. That you would do that in their hearts today. And Father, as we walk with you, as we are called by your name, may we reflect your name to others. May we walk in the spirit of truth looking at your word and longing and hungering for prayer and for righteousness and for using our gifts and extending your grace to others. Would you give us courage to break out of our rut with our spouses and and begin to pursue life like it could end tomorrow? And would you remind us that our children, so precious, We don't have any guarantees. So that this very moment is the only moment we have. Let's make it worth it. To put down the phones and Facebook and the things like that. To distract from being present. Father, would you make us a friend of sinners. That we might direct them to your path. Father, remind us that it's good to be in a house of mourning. Because it changes our perspective. And I pray, Father, that you would have changed our perspective so that we might live well. We pray in Jesus' name. 
Amen.